Let's take a look at paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Everything that you want to know about this condition is actually in the name. And so let's go ahead and dissect each part of this. First, my issue is the fact that, uh, well, I'm not able to properly control the destruction of my, of my RBC, really. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple other things as well that you want to keep in mind. Remember earlier, we had a discussion of G6PD deficiency, and I told you to keep as a differential chronic granulomatous disease. Well, here, with this picture of paroxysmal nocturnal, granted, we're going to focus upon the RBC. However, as far as you're concerned, the clinical picture is a lot broader. What I mean by that is, if you take a look at the statement here, you'll understand that not only is my RBC being affected, as is my neutrophil, but you really, ladies and gentlemen, the clinical picture of platelets becomes important. What I mean by that is, it's not that you're going to have excess destruction of a platelet. In fact, you end up having excess stimulation of platelet function. So if you have excess platelet functioning or you have excess activity of your platelets, then you're forming tons of thrombi. Where? Up and down the body. And that's your first clinical picture. The patients that walk in with PNH are suffering from some kind of thrombotic episode, including what? Well, maybe they might be portal hypertension. Why? Well, the portal vein underwent thrombotic episodes. So imagine now, the portal vein, which would normally be draining the, your uh, super mesenteric vein and the splenic vein, has now become thrombosed. And if it's thrombosed, then you're going to back up into, well, your portal hypertension. So that would be your esophageal varices, that would be kaput medusa, and that would be your, your hemorrhoids, wouldn't it? And so that's portal vein thrombosis. What if it was an issue with my hepatic vein? You call that butt chiari, don't you? So butt chiari type of syndrome would be an issue in the liver, especially zone three. Or there might be inferior vena cava thrombosis. You get my point. So you want to be very smart about how you are developing the thrombus, where you're developing a thrombus, and how your patient is going to present with that thrombus. Platelets is an issue. What about these RBCs? Take a look at the name. Proxismal, episodically, nocturnal, most commonly at night, and then you wake up in the morning and you find red urine, hemoglobinuria. At this point, you should be really familiar with the term hemoglobinuria and understanding what kind of hemolysis would this be. Intervascular hemolysis, what happens to your haptoglobin level? Decreased. Remember, hemoglobin requires a chaperone. It binds to haptoglobin. Free levels of haptoglobin will drop. This complex will then go to your glomerulus, and the hemoglobin will then get filtered, resulting in hemoglobinuria. Well, one of the discussions that we had earlier when we did microcytic anemia was that when you are losing hemoglobin, along with it, what might you be losing? What is that a heme comprised of? Oh, yeah, iron. So during your hemoglobinuria, you might also be losing iron, resulting in iron deficiency anemia. A lot of things here of this particular statement, but I'm giving you a global picture of proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. We will then walk into further details. Now, there is a specific uh, component of your, of your uh, deficiency, and it's known as a glycosyl inositol. Keep that in mind because at some point you will be responsible in great depth to go into what's known as flow cytometry with PNH, GPI, linked proteins. Let's talk about PNH further and its uh, pathophysiology. You must know the following. You have a component called, your focus here, please find decay accelerating factor. So decay accelerating factor is a, a factor which normally controls how much complement activation takes place. Is that clear? So for the most part, think about this. Say that you have too much complement activity. Examples of increased complement pathologies that you're quite familiar with. If the patient has angioedema, and it's the hereditary type, and so what's happening? Around the mucous membrane, you have increased vasodilation. You all know about C1 inhibitor deficiency, correct? That's hereditary angioedema. Too much complement activation. You can have too much complement activation that may then cause, well, destruction to the glomerulus membrane. That brings you to type 2 
MPGN, and it's called nephritic factor, where it stabilizes C3 convertase. This is another major complement pathology where you cannot control the complement activity. And so what happens is that we'll take a look at this further, and we have a mutation decay accelerating factor, which isn't functioning properly, and so therefore you cannot regulate the amount of complement activity. Once again, where is this complement activity, and what kind of cells is this influencing? RBCs and platelets. Those are the two that you pay attention to clinically. Technically, yes, it's neutrophils as well. Platelets, what are you going to have? Excess activity, thrombosis. Hmm. What about the RBC? You will destroy it, most likely where? Based on the name, hemoglobinuria. Intravascular hemolysis. Intravascular, right? So you have destruction of the RBC right there and then in your blood vessel. In the absence of these proteins, which proteins? The decay accelerating factor. There's another one that I'll introduce to you. It's called membrane inhibitor reactive lysis, MIRL. We're going to build bit by bit by bit so that when you deal with PNH, any angle that you're asked on your boards, you'll be able to answer. Let it be the biochemistry, the pathology, the clinical picture, and even some of the pharmacology here. So in the absence of the proteins, who is now susceptible? The RBCs. When? Well, now take a look at the middle name of proxismal. It's nocturnal. So at night is when the RBCs are being destroyed by whom? The complement. Why? Because the accelerating factor can't control the complement anymore. Why at night? Well, when you sleep at night, what happens to your breathing, your respiratory rate? Hopefully you're relaxing and your breathing rate decreases. When your breathing rate decreases, then you end up building up transiently a little bit of carbon dioxide. That is just enough carbon dioxide that the body's retaining in which you created what kind of environment? Acidotic or alkalotic environment? Acidotic environment. Good. So at night, acidotic environment. Wow, this is the perfect environment for complement to go crazy. So they're partying all night, the complement is, and in the process, it's destroying your RBCs. You wake up in the morning, what do you find? Oh, look at the third name, hemoglobinuria. The name has everything that you require for you to properly diagnose your patient clinically. The only thing that you cannot forget is the fact that your patient is going to present with thrombosis. Do not forget that, please, when you're dealing with PNH. Further, well, episodic, that's your proxismal. What's the second, second time that you can develop this acidotic environment? Respiratory acidosis at night? Also, when would you have lactic acidosis? When you exercise, at some point you feel cramps. Well, I feel cramps all the time. <laughs> That's because I'm out of shape. And so when I exercise, I end up going through what? The skeletal muscle undergoes anaerobic glycolysis. When you have anaerobic glycolysis, you're producing more lactic acid. So what kind of acidosis is this? Metabolic acidosis. So take a look at the two bullet points here. Both of these are acidotic environments. We, means what? If a patient has PNH and is exposed to these acidotic environments, then guess what happens? The RBCs will then become destroyed episodically, not all the time. Remember, I told you earlier, the term episodic in pathology is very important because it'll help you distinguish one type of pathology from another, one that is continuous versus one that's episodic. Over time, earlier I told you when you're losing hemoglobin and you tell me about where iron is bound to. It's bound to the heme component, right? So if you're urinating your hemoglobin, along with it, there goes my iron. So also look for microcytic anemia, iron deficiency. Diagnosis, you're going to use a flow cytometry. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to walk you through more detail that's necessary in the next slide. But at this point, flow becomes very important for you, and you're going to be looking for those glycosidal, phosphatidyl, inositol proteins, those gpi link proteins. What else are you going to be looking for? Well, let me show you. Detail? Yes. Necessary? Absolutely. The details are here. Let me slow down just a little bit because students are not so familiar with the flow, not in terms of the method. I'm not going to go through the methodology of flow cytometry. That's covered in immunology. 
So if I were you, I would really know how to perform and how to interpret a flow cytometry. But you should know that it ha- it's a graph, an X and Y, and usually they'll give you four quadrants, right? And in those four quadrants, you might have different, maybe, CD markers. So what particular CD markers do you need to know for PNH is the question. Well, here are the following, and here are the details that are necessary for you to get your question right. Pay attention. You will have to memorize CD55 is D-A-F. Work with me there, and really, say it with me. 55 D-A-F. 55 D-A-F. Is it part of your brain now? Good. You focus on F-F-F-F. So CD55, you must memorize, is your decay accelerating factor. And if there's a mutation there, on flow cytometry, it will then pick it up, and it'll be deficient. Or should I say, it won't pick it up, and so it'll be deficient. So you will not find a cluster. Meaning, you, you know, hopefully you know what I'm referring to when I'm saying flow and I'm saying cluster. If you don't, this would be a good time for you to review quickly how to interpret flow cytometry. What's the other one that you want to pay attention to and memorize? Well, this one, I, I'm sorry, I, can't, I, I don't know. You need to come up with a mnemonic. CD59 is MIRL. MIRL stands for Membrane Inhibitory Reactive Lysis. At this point, at least get one down. CD55 and DAF, and you have CD59 and MIRL. Those are the two major CDs, cluster, right? Cluster designation or differentiation on flow cytometry that are not there in PNH. So if these are not present, who's going crazy? Who's partying all night? Compliment. What does it do? Wreaks havoc on whom? RBCs. Intervascomolysis, there you go. You'll have hemoglobinuria. The absence or reduced expression of both 59 and 55 is diagnostic of PNH. You know this bullet point, you have completely understood what is necessary to confirm your PNH. Now, there are some others here. It's called flara, which I'm not going to go into detail. The only other thing that I wish to bring to your attention is this. You know that you and I, well, we like to work on differentials. And that's the way that you need to be thinking as a clinician. Differentials, differentials, differentials. At some point, you'll be asked to come up with differentials. And if you just sit there like an idiot and not come up with differentials, really, it, 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 it doesn't make you look good. So here is what I'm saying. You've heard of LAP, leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. And with PNH, you'd find this to be decreased. What's the other differential that you should know of in which your LAP, leukocyte alkaline phosphatase, is also decreased? Oh, CML. Okay, so how do you interpret this? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, you will be given the patient and the history, hemoglobinuria, So you'll be given all the information so that you're walking through. And if you see low LAP, then, you you know, it's just part of your confirmation process of PNH. But what LAP does is it then measures the functionality of your neutrophils. That's what it does. Keep that in mind. We've discussed that in WBC pathology when we did CML. You tell me quickly, this is important. Give me a condition in which your LAP is increased. If I tell you functionality is what it's assessing, then you will tell me what? Leukemoid reaction. What's that mean? An exaggerated, exaggerated neutrophil activity. Maybe because your appendici- your, the appendicitis the patient had ruptured. <laughs> All the neutrophils are coming in, and what's your LAP? Elevated. That must be clear before you move on to the next bit of information here.